continues to be here. What about the concept that's going around that most psychiatric disorders are neuroinflammatory disorders? There's a case story of someone who had bipolar disease. They gave her a transplant of lymphocytes, and her bipolar disorder went away. And people are now commenting the fact that in many disease states, the immune reaction is what drives it. And if you eliminate the immune reaction, so could all these factors that make migraine and these psychiatric disorders be comorbid related to the immune system? I don't think, I don't think, I don't know the answer to that and I don't know that anyone really knows the answer to that. It's probably multifactorial in the way that these genetic um, variances give rise to, you know, two different disease states. So neuroinflammation is certainly an emerging and a growing field, there's no doubt. Uh, but its role in migraine and its role in psychiatric disease and its role in many other disease states um, is really not clear yet. But I do think it, it behooves us to be thinking, as neurologists, to be thinking about each of these comorbid conditions as we reach out with our treatments. And so if so it's, it really is very important to have a discussion about depression and anxiety and migraine and peptic ulcer disease because of the issue of using uh, non-steroidal non anti-inflammatories yeah. in the setting of migraine because some of the medications that we prescribe have adverse effects on the comorbid illnesses and some can, sometimes you can get a two for one uh, as one treats and, and if one doesn't proactively seek out that history, one can really uh, not optimally treat. I think it becomes, it's so common and it's so important in the overlap that it really is part and parcel of every clinician's day-to-day -day interaction with a migraine patient. From a mechanistic point of view, I think the inflammatory story um, didn't make much progress in the last 15 years in migraine. When you look at the medicines that were developed to chase inflammatory target substance P antagonists, uh, the plasma protein extravasation inhibitors, the TRPV1 um, antagonists, they all failed in controlled trials. And or we, you know, we, during this discussion, we're going to be talking about things that have worked. And I, I think it's important uh, when I, you know, when we're talking about these things that have happened, that the, we've learned a lot by negative things as well. Not everything works in migraine. And actually there are at least 10 examples of things that have failed miserably because the, um, you know, one of the nice things about migraine as a field is we've been able to really apply biology at several levels um, to understand it and get information that is positive and negative to kind of add things together. So. I, I, I'm, at one level, it's disappointing that those medicines didn't work, but at another level, it's actually infor reinforces that when things work, um, it's pretty secure. I couldn't agree more because when you look at this field, we've moved away from the vessel as a target. Um, we, for decades, we were developing therapies that targeted the blood vessel and we wanted to constrict the blood vessel because we thought that was important in the biology of this disease. We moved away from that. As Peter says, we moved into this neurogenic inflammation and we chased you know, two decades worth of, of, of tar you know, new molecules that all didn't pan out. Now, and we'll talk about this obviously, we have uh, much more specific and much more relevant and much more robust targets that are giving rise to really therapies that are changing, that are going to change this field forever. Good.